talk with him and then maybe get that into the here, come on in. Hey, Larry. Hey, Larry, hey, what's up? George, Steve, thanks for having me. I, yeah. I think I'm ready. All right, here we go. Generally, the concept is a serial idea. One of the main ideas was to have, depending on whether it would be every 10 minutes or every 20 minutes, a sort of a cliffhanger situation that we get our hero into. And each cliffhanger is better than the one before. Yeah, that is the progression we have to do. The trouble with cliffhangers is, you get somebody into something, you sort of have to get them out in a plausible way. A believable way, anyway. Do you have a name for this person? I do for our leader. I hate this, but go ahead. Indiana Smith. It has to be unique. It's a character. Very Americana Square. He was born in Indiana. What does she call him? Indy? That's what I was thinking. Or Jones. Then people can call him Jones. That's an important concept of the movie, that it be totally believable. It's a spaghetti western, only it takes place in the 30s. Or it's James Bond and it takes place in the 30s. Except James Bond tends to get a little outrageous at times. We're gonna take the unrealistic side of it off and make it more like the Clint Eastwood westerns. James Bond and the Man With No Name were very good at what they did. They were very fast with a gun. They were, they were slick. They were professional. They were supermen. Like Mifune. Yes, like Mifune. He's a real professional. He's really good. And that is the key to the whole thing. That's something you don't see that much anymore. And one of the things that really helped Mifune in all those Kurosawa movies is that he was always surrounded by really inept characters, really silly buffoons, which made him so much more majestic. Well, they shouldn't be buffoons. The one thing we're going to do is make a very good period piece that is realistic and believable. A 30s movie in the, even in the Sam Spade genre. Even in the Maltese Falcon, there were some pretty goofy characters, but they were all pretty real in their own bizarre way. Elijah Cook. Yeah, Elijah Cook might not have been the brightest person in the world. In a way, he was the buffoon of the piece. But at the same time, he was very dangerous and he was very... Did you see The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? Yeah. 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 It, the, the Eli Walsh character is a goofy character, but at the same time, he's very dangerous and he's very funny and he's... We can have that kind of thing. The main thing is for him to be a superhero in the best sense of the word, which is John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Sean Connery tradition of a man who we can all look up to and say, now there's somebody who really knows his job. He's really good at what he does, and he's a very dangerous person. Or even the Clark Gable thing we talked about. Yeah, the, the Clark Gable mold. The fact that he is slightly scruffy. Now, several aspects that we've discussed before. The image of him, which is the strongest, is the treasure of Sierra Madre outfit, which is the khaki pants, he's got the leather jacket, that sort of felt hat and a pistol and holster with a World War I sort of flap over it. The other good thing we've added to him, which may be fun, is a bullwhip. That's really his trademark. That's really what he's good at. He has a pistol, and he's probably very good at that, but at the same time, he happens to be very good with a bullwhip. It's really more of a hobby than anything else. Uh, maybe he came from Montana someplace, and he... There are freaks who love bullwhips. <laughs> they, they, sure. <laughs> they, they just do it all the time. You, you can swing over things. You can... Uh, there's so many things you can do with it. I thought he carried it rolled up. It's like a samurai sword. He carries it back there, and you don't even notice it. Maybe even... This has to do with the other part of this character... But I was thinking of Kung Fu, Karate. But I don't want to load him up too much. It seems like it would be nice if, once stripped of his bullwhip, left him weak, if we had to worry. Just a little worried about him being too... Yeah, that was what I thought. That's why I was sort of iffy about throwing it in. If we don't make him vulnerable... What's he afraid of? He's got to be afraid of something. If we don't make him vulnerable, he's got no problems. We'll shut that idea for now. Assume there's an archaeologist who spent years studying this. He might have some kind of awe and respect for virgin tombs. Oh, does it bother him to go in and, Maybe you know... he thinks that most archaeologists are just full of shit and that somebody's going to rip this stuff off anyway. Better that he rips it off and gets it to a museum where people can study it and rip it off right. He knows not to go in there like a bull in a china shop and destroy half the stuff that's valuable. I like that. The doctor with a bullwhip. Yeah, it's sort of an odd juxtaposition. Peter Falk is one way of looking at him, a Humphrey Bogart character. The fact that he's sort of scruffy and uh, not yeah. the right image, but... Yeah, Peter's too scruffy. Yeah. We'll figure a way of laying that out in his personality so it's easily identifiable. Remember the movie Soldier of Fortune with Clark Gable? There was a good deal of Rhett Butler in that character. The devil-may-care kind of guy who can handle situations. Yeah, he just can't settle down. 
it's a nice contrast. It's like the James Bond thing. Instead of being a martini drinking cultural kind of sophisticate, he's the sort of intellectual college professor James Bond. He's a super agent. Mm -hmm. Clark Kent. Yeah, it's that thing, which is fun. It's the same idea, only twisted around a little bit. The film starts in the jungle, South America someplace. We get one of these great scenes with the pack animals going up the mist-covered hills. Very exotic mist-filled jungles and mountains. We actually talked about it a little different from this, but you can correct me if I've gone off what we talked about the last time. Where he goes in the cave? Mm -hmm. This is where he goes into the cave. We had it where there's a couple native bears, whatever, and sort of a couple of Mexican, well, not Mexican, let's put it. They're like Mayan. Yeah, they're, they're the third world's local Sleezos. Foremen, the guys he hired. They speak English. He's a partner with these other two guys. Well, they're not very trustworthy. Eli Wallace types. Mm. It's all sort of misty and primeval, King Kong-ish. The pressure builds and one of the natives cracks, throws down his thing, and scurries off. Also, in the process of this, you understand that the two guys are plotting against the other guy. One of the guys tries to kill him and take the map, shoot him in the back. That's when you first see him with the bullwhip. That's where the plot comes alive. So, he and the other one guy go into the temple. You know the guy's going to shoot him in the back eventually. As they get into the temple, you get into all these things. Like, there's this giant spider in there. They're walking, and our hero goes into a shadow. When he comes out of the shadow, there's two tarantulas on him. He doesn't notice them right away. He goes into another shadow, and he comes out with four tarantulas on him. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting crazy with the tarantulas, and it's all very spooky. We get to a point in the tomb, and we do this thing where there's like this light shaft coming down from inside the temple, a little beam. You see him look at it. We had him go through the wall. Uh, actually, we had it happen first. What happened? We had it first where he sees the light and he tosses a thing in it, a stick, and these giant spikes come out and go whooshing. When the spikes come out and go like that, there should be remains, skeletal remains, skewered on some of them, uh, of victims that have been there before. It's kind of like one of those rides at Disneyland. Why are we letting the second Sleezo get away? Why can't we sacrifice him to the temple? Well, we can. I just did it as building the pressure, but we can keep him in. We'll follow it through, and then we'll see where you want to dispose of him. If the hero tells him to stick with him, and the guy in his panic makes that fatal one step sideways, you can build the terror. Mm -hmm. And there's seismic rumblings all the time, there's stalagmites, things going drip, drip, drip. It's going to be a sound experience going through that cave. And there's nothing more terrifying than skeletons. Yeah, that kind of stuff. You don't know what's going to happen. This is the first scene in the movie. This scene should get at least four major screams. The audience won't trust anyone after that. They won't trust the film. Oh, there's also the thing you can do, which is your famous Jaws, which is not only skeletons, but we can have skeletons that aren't that old. They just have drawn skin all over them that are lurking in the shadows. Anyway, he goes through a series of really spooky, scary things. What we're doing here really is designing a ride at Disneyland. Yes. They get into the main throne room. There's a temple figure, idol, whatever. He moves in and he studies it. It's almost like a karate or a tai chi exercise. He studies the whole thing. He knows it's a trap. All these sort of silent things that are in there. Oh, I know what one of those things was. Poison sticks that were put into the walls. You spring something, it shoots out. They're all over the place. He sees one, he does one, Boing! He looks around and the whole room is a sort of honeycomb. That's a great idea. Yeah, there's just holes everywhere. Each one is attached to, uh, uh, they don't have to be big spears, they're like arrows. Or like little projectiles. Yeah, yeah, little darts. Obviously there's some sort of weighted trap thing there too. Take one step and turn and then all of a sudden you hear the... He hears it and I have one of two choices. One, he just runs like hell to try and get out of the room before whatever it is, or... Then I've got all these things. I want it to be action. You know what it could be? I have a great idea. When he goes into the cave, it's not straight. The whole thing is on an incline on the way in. He hears this, grabs the thing, comes to a corridor, and there's a 65-foot boulder that's form-fitted to only roll down the corridor coming straight at him. And it's a race. Nice. He gets to outrun the boulder. Mm -hmm. It then comes to a rest, blocks the entrance of the cave, Nobody will ever come in again. This boulder is the size of a house. It matches the partner. Right, the guy can't run fast enough. It's all that kind of thing. Stone, ancient gyrations of things that are so fun. It's really sort of Land of the Pharaohs stuff. Giant crazy traps that were set so long ago to keep people from getting in there. Dr. Jones, now you, you must understand that this is all strictly confidential. The next scene is in Washington. This is where we get the big assignment scene with the blackboard. 
This is where they explain about the Ark. I think also, you've been describing this to people as a science fiction film, which is good. I have not. It's in Rolling Stone. Anyway, the idea is that you explain the Ark and the power it held and the fact that they have been searching. What they want him to do is get it before the Nazis do. The thing of it is that in the end, they convince him to do it because they say this European version of himself is the one who found it. He's the corrupt version of our guy. He's like Moriarty. When that name comes up, his ears perk and a whole change comes over him. You realize that this thing goes way back with this grudge. It's Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes. He could be French or Italian. No, Italians are too crazy. Indiana Jones. Where does he meet the girl then? Nepal? Yeah, she is running this American hostel and bar, Rick's place, in the middle of Nepal in some little village. She's a rough and tumble girl. He's sitting there with the girl. Cut to her saying, long time no see. Yeah, I guess it has been a long time. Or do you cut to him walking into the bar and he sort of walks up and sits down and she comes up and says, I like, don't want to throw away their first sight of each other. I would very much like if she didn't see him at first, but he witnessed her dealing with a bunch of rowdies. He's on the other side and watches her in action. He gets a lot of respect for her. She's really grown up. Then he deals with her. I like the idea of cutting to her and seeing her in action. Tough. Her feeling when he walks in is, here is a guy she loved. He left her. All of a sudden, out of the blue, he shows up. In the middle of Nepal. Her first reaction would be, my god, what are you doing here? Or it could be total sullen. I like the idea that she greets him with disdain when he first walks in. She says, you're too late. He says he's been traveling around. I wonder if her first reaction isn't to hit him. Something unusual, not just a slap. First sight, register who it is. Still with that right cross, I taught you. Hey, Junie, long time no see. Wham! And she says, get out! When he asks her for it, she could be all pissed off about that stuff, because that's what got her there. He says he wanted to buy it. She says no. He leaves, and she reveals that she's got it. Then, the Nazis burst in, and he protects her. He kills a couple Nazis. She says, what was that all about? He tells her they're after her pendant. This could be a big fight. Uh, I like the idea that he's somewhere else, either upstairs or coming back in from outside. It would be nice if they left in a huff. They fought or something. He left rather pissed. Eh, I don't think he would leave without the pendant. That's the only thing that bothers me about that. So he goes upstairs and stays up, plotting how he's going to take it off her. That makes him into a real rat. No, that's all right. He never does it. What he does is just the opposite. Save her life. Eh, no matter how you do it, the fact that he thought about it is the rat part. Rat Butler was a rat. He wasn't a real rat. He proved himself by raising her family. Before that, he was a gambler, uh, dealt with cheap ladies. There's a difference between being a rat and somebody who's having fun. He never hurt anybody. I'm a little confused about Indiana at this point. I thought he'd do anything for the pendant. But he still has to have some moral scruples. He has to be a person we can look up to. We're doing a role model for little kids, so we have to be careful. We need someone who's honest, trusting, and true. But at the same time, he's confronted with this difficult problem. We have a great thing when she won't give it to him. She doesn't like him. The Germans come in and start punching her around and asking where the pendant is. And it's sitting right there. What's it made of? Uh, it's stone. I thought it was metal. It could be metal. It can't be wood because it's too old. I love the idea of fire. When it rolls across the floor, could it roll into the fire? You don't think it's going to burn up, but he has to retrieve it. Maybe at the same moment, he uses the fire as a weapon. I'd love it if he burns down her only stake in the world, which is the mm. inn. <laughs> That's a good idea. I like the idea of doing the old branding iron scene before he bursts in. I love branding iron stuff. It's a red hot poker. When he comes in, he knocks the poker out of their hands. The poker goes into the curtains and immediately starts the fire. They fight. When it's all over, they end up with the pendant and a pile of rubble. Wouldn't the Germans pull guns and start shooting? Yeah, but he comes in and uses his whip. He also maybe has a gun. This Nazi's struggling with our hero. They're kind of rolling around on the ground and one of these henchmen is standing in the doorway trying to get a clear shot because they keep moving. Two of the other Germans who are struggling with the girls say, shoot some boss. The German who's rolling around with our hero panics, pulls out his own gun and shoots the guy with the Tommy gun, kills them both to save himself. How do you guys feel about subtitles. I don't like them. I don't either. I think it is better if we don't understand what they're saying. I like hearing English with a German accent. Today is history and you are part of it. Please. I like America. You people have nothing to bargain with. 
You'll never get the land back. Okay, let's say the arch villain is French. When he's speaking to this German... Maybe they could speak English? Maybe the arch villain is smart enough to speak German, but they're not smart enough to speak French. Well, what about the Arab kid? He's just talking endlessly, and you never understand what he's saying. Yeah, but if he's going to be the buffoon character, you're going to want to understand it. Maybe he slows down once in a while to say something stupid. When he talks fast, you just don't care. And we might be able to play on that. It's conceivable that he and his father could speak English because they work with English archaeologists all the time. Yeah, I'll just write the entire movie in English. (laughs) Now, she... I don't know what we do with her. How about if we have her kidnapped? Who would kidnap her and for what reason? If he gets jumped on the street and they take her, it's obviously the Nazis. This is where you can have a great street fight. Maybe use his bullwhip. In the process, she gets captured. How does he react to that? Does he go on to see his friend, or does he go right after her? Yeah, it seems pretty mundane that he would go on to his friend after that. Is there some way to really convince him that she's died? That's fun. But you have to do it really well, and I don't know how. It could be the obsession trick. The car she's in goes off and disappears, then it goes off a cliff and burns. We and Indy feel that she's dead when we see the car burning at the bottom of a cliff. That would work. Then we have the scene with the old friend. It will be better because he feels terrible. It might be interesting to zap it with something. Some kind of thing to hype that scene in terms of action and suspense and terror. Maybe somebody plants a bomb while they're talking. And they're upset by the Germans? Somebody who was following him. What if the guy who's bringing the tray of food is pouring powder in all the drinks and all through the food and the soup? He's laced everything with poison. For both of them. At one point, our hero would take the chicken and start gesturing with it. He's too caught up to eat it. He's not paying attention. And this cat jumps up on the table and nibbles on the food. The cat freaks, just goes crazy, jumps up, climbs the walls. He says, I'm not going to eat this. What if it's an animal we hate? An animal the audience can't stand. A monkey is a perfect thing. Maybe this Arab operative is the one who has the monkey. It's a villain monkey. The Arab can make him do things, and he sends him in there to steal the piece. Mm. The little monkey goes to the girl or to the guy and makes friends, and tags along. He's like a little spy. It has to happen real quick because it's very short until the time we want to kill him. Before we kill this monkey, I want to really make him a villain. What if... He's along when they're headed out to the friends. The ambush takes place, and as Indy is fighting them off, the girl jumps into a basket to hide, and the monkey leads the Arabs to the girl. That's how they get her. That's good. The monkey should be dressed up as a little Arab. (laughs) I like the idea of not only having a turban, but also a little backpack. Could we get the monkey to do a Heil Hitler? That's up to you and the trainer. And the monkey. He goes about a quarter of a mile away to dig up the real temple. At this point, we either dissolve and he breaks through, or we cut to the villains. This might be an interesting place to start going to the villains. We can tell parallel stories. We cut back to the girl, and the villains come back. We have a scene with the villains torturing the girl a little bit. She's so tired of being tied up and pushed around, she becomes a real active part of the story now. What if she became involved with the Frenchman? for her own purposes. She's a free spirit. A tough woman of the world, which would appeal to him. She's been deserted by her guy. The Frenchman wants her, even though she's not receptive to it. Say he's the Claude Rains character. It makes sense that he's attracted to Barbara Stanwyck. The German says it's time to get rid of her, and the French guy says, no. There should be a real slimy German character. He's the only Gestapo involved there. Every time you see him, you know it's gonna be the worst pain, death by torture. This guy looks like a ferret. He's got that slick black hair. His name is Himmler or something like that. We can do a threatening torture scene. We've had enough of this young girl. Now you're really going to talk. They are really angry with the Frenchman about the fact that he didn't pick the right temple. We sort of get their point of view. Zephyr wants this right away. I thought we had figured out how they chose this spot. We had figured out that they had just read the textbook. Mm, I like it better that the only way you can find out is to have that piece. What if it rolls across the floor and into the fire, and one of those guys sees it, goes over, grabs it, and screams. Back here, he says they had a copy of one part, but how did they get the other? A man had it burned into his hand. Mm. Does it solve that for you? I love it. And at the time, it's just like a joke, this guy burning his hand. You don't even suspect that it would be any kind of a plot point. Then you cut to Indy, and they're still digging away, and they say, we've got it. There's that moment. 
there it is. This is where we get into the trouble with the water, if we're going to do that. We might as well figure it out here. You could explain it. Frenchman says, you know so much about this thing, I suppose that you uh, know about the defense system that we uh, discovered in our diggings down the street. Yes, an offshoot of the Nile. On either side would be these giant cisterns of water that were being stored there from an oasis. So the water comes up. From the bottom. You like it to splash. The fact that it just sort of seeps up. A geyser of water. Mm, I'm not seeing what you're talking about. What would it look like? If there were like two levels, and he goes into one level, and there's this giant artesian well, water pouring out of old broken fountains. Uh, you're never going to convince anybody that there's water there in the desert. Why can't they close him in the temple and lock the door? And all of a sudden, you hear strange animal noises. The Germans had put some kind of man-eating animal to get him, like a couple lions or tigers, and all he has is his bullwhip, and maybe some clever devices hidden under his clothes. We'll do an animal fight. He works his way out this little chute where the animals came out. Somehow he gets out that way. Uh, I don't know how. You know what it's like to fly in a tiger from South Africa. It wouldn't have to be a neighborhood tiger. There aren't any tigers out there. Well, I'm not in love with the idea. You could have bats and stuff, make it slightly spooky. People hate snakes, possibly when it gets down there in the first place. It's like hundreds of thousands of snakes. Yeah, when he when he first jumps down in the hole, it's a giant snake pit. Knowing that when the torch goes out, it's the idea of being in a room, in a black room with a lot of snakes. That will be really scary. Yeah, the way to do it is like squirm. It has more worms than you can imagine. Snakes are ugly when they're all piled up with each other. I wonder what their reaction to light is. You can get a snake charmer or something. All you need is a lot of snakes in a very small spot, so it looks like there are a lot of snakes everywhere. You can also do a lot with sound, and, and close shots of snakes slithering on hands. What's real scary to me is when the rock comes down to seal the temple. We shouldn't have any snakes in the opening sequence, just tarantulas. Save the snakes for now. It would be funny if somewhere early in the movie, he somehow implied that he was not afraid of snakes. Later you realize that's one of his big fears. Maybe it's better if you see early, maybe in the beginning, that he's afraid. I hate snakes, Jock! It should be slightly amusing that he hates snakes. And then he opens this up. I can't go down there. Why did there have to be snakes? Anything but snakes. Y you can play it for comedy. The one thing that could happen is that he gets trapped with all these snakes. Down here, after we go through the villains dealing with the girl, Indy finds the thing, the Germans appear, the girl ought to be with them. As the thing slams shut, you see her mixed emotions, but she's siding with the rival. The other thing they could do is throw the girl down there with him. In the snake pit? Yeah, that would be a natural thing. They don't need her anymore. Mm, I've seen that in so many movies. They throw them in together to suffer their fate. It would be a great stunt. Say it's like 20 feet down or further. They just throw her in and the guy would have to catch her. Love among the snakes. What if the Frenchman made her wear strange clothes? I'd love to discover her in the strangest outfit you've ever seen because he wants her dressed up like some sort of crazy princess. She's apologizing. I can't help it. He made me put this on. Something completely ridiculous for the escape. The one thing is to make the whole thing plausible, especially the ending. So you can assume the whole thing was covered up, is lost in Nazi files, but this really happened. Maybe we could figure out a way where he's going to sabotage it. Not only does the thing blow up, but he has to set some kind of a time bomb that will blow the whole place up. The Guns of Navarone worked because it was a mission movie. They had to destroy something rather than capture something. His assignment is to recover the Ark. But if you see a submarine base, you blow it up. The problem I have is that we wind up the way every Bond movie has ended. He's on the island, he has to get out there with the girl, and they do get out, they're on the water, and the whole place blows up. I love that. Every Bond movie has made money too. If you follow classic dramatic plotting, that's what is going to happen. I think it would be better if we just let the villains get scrunched and that's how he gets away from them. I like the idea of the whole island blowing up and finding a clever way for them to survive, whatever that is. What if the guy opens the arc? You visualize that it explodes, and then the top slams down again. It takes care of everyone, and we see a lot of this uh, electrical stuff zapping people and, and starting fires, like, everywhere. That's possible. I saw the opening of the arc and the resulting chaos as the climax of the movie. The quicker we get from that point to fade out, the better. You let the effect go for a little bit, then you cut outside and the arcs are going around. It makes him very godlike if one of the bolts doesn't zap him. If we make the effect real, it shouldn't last long, or that hurts it. Cut to Washington. Our guy is getting congratulated, they crate it up, put it in an army warehouse somewhere. That's how it ends. Very bureaucratic. 
the feeling is that the Ark is the real thing. That it really is a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Supernatural. It's sitting down in the government warehouse. The bureaucracy is the big winner in the film. Headline. Hitler invades Poland. Without the Ark. <laughs> <laughs> So I told him the story of Indiana Jones, and he said, oh, that's it, let's do it. When we go back, we'll hire a writer, and we'll get going on it. And we spent three days with a tape recorder going. And in those three days, Larry George and I pretty much outlined and sketched in the whole plot. George had things he wanted in the movie, and Stephen had kinds of scenes he wanted to shoot. And we were creating a story that would support all these ideas. Okay, this is Jack, not George Lucas anymore. If you want to see the transcript in its entirety, there's a link in the description to check it out yourself. Might I suggest page 37, which has a pretty scandalous conversation about how old Marion should be. If you liked what we did in this video, we performed another conversation from the transcript that became a scene in the second Indiana Jones film. You can watch that conversation in a bonus video found exclusively on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service that supports exclusive ad-free videos from YouTube's top education creators. I love Nebula because it's a platform made by creators for creators, and it helps me make videos without having to worry as much about the pesky YouTube algorithm. You can watch that exclusive video on Nebula right now with a link in the description, all thanks to Nebula's partnership with Curiosity. Stream, an award-winning streaming service with thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles. I'm certain that Steven Spielberg, a World War II fanatic, would love their documentary Five Submarines Against the Nazis, the story of the U.S. submarines that made the liberation of France possible. If you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, you get access to CuriosityStream and Nebula. This partnership is honestly one of the best deals in online streaming. For less than $15 a year, you get access to an incredible library of educational content while also supporting your favorite online creators, which I hope includes me. Clicking that link in the description is a way of showing that you liked this video and that you want to see more like it. And as always, along with Nebula, my Patreon supporters also got the bonus episode. A big thanks to them for helping out the channel. Thanks for watching.